other engineering programs, we have greater demands. There are new things coming up every day. So I will quickly touch on some advancements, uh, identify the challenges which all of us face, and uh, I try to put maybe, I'll just talk more about the bachelor's degree models, you know, categorized into three uh, different models and propose some models also for master's degree. Okay. So when we talk about uh, recent medical technology, I mean, we think of uh, like Mayo and the Cleveland Clinic. Okay. So you look at the top 10 uh, innovations. There's a closed loop uh, deep brain stimulation system with algorithms to adjust the treatment based on level of neurotransmitters. Okay. Uh, 3D printed <coughs> pre-surgical models. These models are so successful that they result in better outcomes and better spine implant for lower back pain. Once again, you see these are all areas that we have contributed to. Okay. So then I went to a Cleveland Clinic and look at some of their areas. There's sound here. In saving eight, lives, innovation in robotic not intended surgery. to replace clinicians or clinical judgment, an extension AI of the physician's the hands to enhance and complement surgery the very human interaction accuracy. of provider and patient. Advances in, in the healthcare field range from AI the development of more accurate game, planning with its applications in decision support, image analysis, and patient triage. With their ability to reduce variation and duplicate testing, Decision support systems quickly decipher large amounts of data within the electronic medical record. AI technology is also taking the uncertainty out of viewing patient scans by highlighting problem areas on images, aiding in the screening and diagnosis process. Artificial intelligence helps with the issue of physician burnout by collecting patient data via an app or text messaging. Chatbots now ask patients a series of questions regarding their symptoms taking the guesswork out of self-diagnosis and saving both the patient and provider time and money. With the AI integration, working smarter enables solutions to a variety. Number eight, innovation in robotic surgery. An extension of the physician's hands, robotic surgery provides pinpoint accuracy. Advances in the field range from the development of more accurate planning tools and software to increased automation of tasks during surgery. Precision surgical arms designed for proper instrument positioning and implantation during spinal surgery increase surgeon precision. Automating the bronchoscopy process avoids incisions with the insertion of flexible tubes through the body's natural openings. Using a controller-like interface, this advancement increases accuracy and safety while decreasing invasiveness and cost. Robotization is also reaching endovascular procedures like percutaneous coronary intervention, PCI, and peripheral vascular intervention, PVI, which traditionally require the surgeon to wear lead. Using robotics now lowers risk for patients and the surgeon while improving outcomes. Robotic surgery provides precision, flexibility, and control. Paired with shortened recovery time and limited pain, patients benefit from the continued advancements in the field. So then I went to Johns Hopkins and you look at the brain machine interface. Uh, some of these technological innovations are indicative or they are suggesting that we need to train our students and future graduates to uh, have exposure to these areas. Okay. Prosthetic arm, I think uh, some of the universities already have capstone projects or senior design projects in which parts of these are uh, uh, combining with the PhD or master student, they could be contributing to them. Okay. Uh, so this uh, slide I like uh, because I, I, I am in Boston now and the young lady that you see, she lost her limb in Boston bombing. And it is because of the orthopedic surgeons as well as the biomedical engineering innovations, she, she was a ballet dancer and she is able to recover and perform as well as before. Okay. Uh, for, you know, we are all familiar with the capsule endoscopy. 
uh, Google Glass in operating rooms, you know, Bionic Man. We have to see that there is a lot of translational research, particularly from uh, military medicine, and some of these are available in the public domain, okay, artificial limbs, blood clotting, and wound repair. A big area that is growing is the telemedicine and wearable. Wearable sensors have really come in in a big way, and these are also areas for students to work on projects, at the same time for faculty to do some research on. And this area, I must uh, emphasize, is taking from treating, diagnosing the sick and treating the disease to prevention. So prevention is very important, and with the wearables, we are getting into this arena. Here is a tiny implantable cardiac monitor, okay? smart contact lenses where you can also sense glucose, retinal prosthesis system. So these are also making use of uh, high technology. Uh, looking at the EEG systems with uh, so many electrodes, you are able to understand and analyze the brain function. And we uh, realize that you know, neural engineering and uh, getting into diseases such as Alzheimer's pose such a big challenge. So this is another area of growth, and this way we need to be also exposed to them. Okay. Uh, diagnostic methods, uh, you know, again, there are so many innovations. Uh, artificial spleen, blood test to detect protein linked with pancreatic cancer, and tool that can plug gunshot wound in seconds. Okay. Uh, ICDs have been growing rapidly, and their contributions can be appreciated by cardiac patients, but it's also a good area for uh, educators. Okay. Uh, PET CT, you know, we, unless you offer a special course in imaging, you know, it's difficult to cover at the undergraduate level, but you can expose the students to them. Uh, high intensity focused ultrasound, where you use ultrasound to target and to treat and later also to track. So very good example of application of ultrasound. Okay. Robot assisted radiation therapy, you know, we seem to be getting closer to the medical physicists, so this is an area where uh, we can work closely at the hospital. Anesthesia machines are getting so complex. So when we talk about multidisciplinary uh, knowledge, you know, anesthesia machine is an excellent example of that. 3D ultrasound and going into 4D, you know, image processing, image reconstruction and rendering, all these are areas of interest. So now let me come to the challenges, which is, I think, probably encountered by all. It is very difficult to keep up with the technological innovations. Okay? Time constraints for training. Okay? The time is in the US four years typically. Uh, maybe in some European uh, models, there are three years. They have three, five, to five years for masters. U.S. is also coming up with many programs where they have a five-year BS-MS program. So they typically do the BS in four years, and they are allowed to take two of their courses in the senior year to master's program. If you're starting with a new program, having the right manpower and facility requirements, unless there is blessing from above and unless there are funds available, it is not easy. I've gone through at least two such startups right from ground floor. Uh, in one uh, scenario, it was I was given the funds before I started. In the other one, it was not that easy at all. And I'm still struggling. Okay. Attracting and retaining good students. We say biomedical engineering is a great field, but we need to get very good students. Otherwise, they will come, they will start, and they will drop out. Okay. So retention is very important. And Another area is also recruiting dedicated faculty and retaining them. If industries pay them much higher salaries than the universities, then it's not easy to retain, particularly the younger faculty. Okay. Program accreditations. In order for the programs to be recognized and for the students to opt to come to your program, they need to be accredited. Uh, as you know, US, we have ABET, you know, Accreditation Board for Engineering and Technology, 
that's a very good one and they do accredited programs internationally in addition you know in every country there are also boards of higher education and they have their own policies and requirements for accreditation so we need to be adaptive to emerging trends pedagogies they keep changing as well with the students using different technologies we need to apply them as well in teaching i normally like to also just not sing the glory but also talk about failures i know dr yadin david talked about like 200000 or so i even saw a higher number and i did ask somebody from na nsf and nih how many of them can be contributable to biomedical engineering and how many can we uh, avert or how many can we solve there was no answer given you know you know that uh, institute of medicine had 100000 few years ago uh, to say, and the article to err is uh, in the in the medical field to err is human so we have to also explain to our students about failures i think teaching failure analysis is a very important part of uh, biomedical engineering uh, obviously the manufacturers are not going to give the information easily you can get that from things such as the mod database you know metal and hip implants they failed cement used to replace bones they failed okay uh, renal denervation i think many of you are familiar with how this was once thought to be a great uh, technique but it did not work well uh, defibrillator leads they have failed and recently a uh, balloon catheter multiple complaints of balloons bursting below the rated burst pressure okay this caused the risk of vessel injury and balloon fragments in patient okay uh, left ventricular assist system or lvads patient using this assist system may be subject to blood clots and death due to malfunction causing the outflow graft to close up over time uh, defibrillator okay this is really bad if because it's supposed to be saving life if it freezes up after delivering a shock it is indeed bad so robotics you know robotics have also failed I and mean, we talked about the you know the number of like over the last 15 years there have been like 1.75 million robotic procedures uh but there have been events which have reported which due to robotic failures many have caused in injury and some have resulted in death so this is a problem when new hospitals are going to be adopting uh, robot assisted surgery uh, it's going to be something they need to take into account what if it fails so at this point i need to say clearly Uh, I used to work at Mass General, and we really pay, paid a lot of attention to training the doctors. You know, when the system was installed, we went through a very, very rigorous training procedure, and there were a lot of simulations done to ensure there was no failure. I see there are people from ECRI here. You know, they have an excellent list of uh, health technology hazards. Hackers. You know, we all been looking at. Uh, cyber security issues retained sponges improperly sent ventilator alarms uh, mishandling flexi flexible endoscopes after disinfection so confusing dose rates with flow rates so here i again emphasize training is very important uh, injury risk from overload patient lift system or overhead patient head system cleaning fluid seeping into electrical components can lead to equipment damage again flawed battery charging so this is the 2019 they also released the 2020 misuse of surgical staplers adoption of point of care ultrasound problems infection risk hemodialysis risk uh, again surgical robot problems alarm alert and notification overload cyber security is you know getting a lot of attention and biomedical engineers do get involved in this greatly okay so i also thought i will show some numbers so these are recalls you can see uh, striker agreed to pay 4.1.4 billion dollars okay johnson and johnson 4 billion dollars so while we emphasize 
good design practices, we should train the students to understand where the failures could occur. And of course, FDA also requires detailed analysis on this before they get approval for the products. Okay? You can see there are a lot of things, and this is also another avenue for biomedical engineers. After doing a bachelor's degree, they can go into the legal area and they can start suing the companies which had problems. Okay? But on the positive side, uh, medical device, that is the market growth, you can see that the uh, Americas is larger uh, market for the medical devices. The global, you can see continuously, it is reaching something like half a trillion dollars. That's huge. And we are training students and there is going to be constant change in our field. You know, you cannot use the same areas. Uh, Professor, yeah, that is, that is true. That's a lot of a uh, lot of amount for you. So degrees earned, it is increasing steadily over the years. And in the last, I think, couple of years, it is starting to get saturated because of jobs and then people going, you know. So this is a difficult slide, but basically, if you look at the public universities and private universities, there are more than 150 accredited programs. You know, Georgia Tech claims to have the largest number of uh, biomedical engineering students, but there are many programs over there. So this is a model that I follow. Okay. So you have to have uh, biomedical core courses and elective courses. So this is where we can facilitate all these emerging trends. Okay, you need to have capstone projects. So these are absolutely essential for the biomedical engineering programs to stand out. But in order to get to that level, you must prepare them with appropriate electrical and mechanical engineering background. In some universities, they have chemical engineering background and they are mainly training their students to go into graduate studies. The ones that, like the program that I have, we focus more on electrical, mechanical, and computer science. And we believe that this is absolutely essential to work in hospitals. So if you really want to work in the clinical engineering area and not necessarily go to research, this will be an excellent model. You need to have some exposure to uh, biology, some biochemistry, physiology, and then of course the soft skills are necessary, humanities, social sciences, and physical science. Of course, math, physics, chemistry, they are very essential. Again, so the model one, model one is the one which is very common and these, they, delib they mostly train their students to get into graduate school. Okay. So they have quite a few courses on sciences in addition to the biomedical engineering core and elective courses. Okay. Uh, examples are, you know, the top ten you can see they are. A curriculum model two is the one that I use actually. So you do have the basic sciences, math, engineering, uh, biomedical engineering core and elective courses. But the important component we have introduced is a mandatory component of internship or co-op or experiential learning. So in our model there are two semesters or eight months of learning with an option to even go to a third semester, which means by the time the students graduate, they have almost one year of experience. The third model I did want to use, because this is for continuous development or continuing education for ones who have associate degree. Okay, there are quite a few people, and they would like to have courses in the evenings, for example, and they want to upgrade. They may be more as electronic engineering associate degree holders. And there are others even with um, degrees in mechanical engineering and they can be very useful. And they come under the biomedical engineering technology and they start actually accrediting programs with the engineering technology as well. Okay. The core courses I mentioned, but you know, we need to introduce biomedical engineering right in the beginning to ensure the students are indeed interested in that. Uh, courses such as signals and systems, biomechanics, biomaterials, Biostatistics, these are very essential. And then elective courses you can choose and depending on the program you can have tracks. So somebody can just do medical devices, uh, telemedicine and uh, medical imaging and optics or clinical engineering. Okay? Or the ones clinical engineering, medical robotics and uh, telemedicine. So 
the, in my program, there are three elective courses typically, but every course has a lab component. So we do say that we have three hours of lecture, two hours of lab, so which means it is 40% hands-on. And the lab component is absolutely essential. And to have the labs, it is best to have some collaboration with the hospitals. Uh, otherwise, you should try to have all the clinical equipment right in the university like I have. So this is really helpful for students to get co-op and also get to learn what these are. So these uh, slides, I think uh, there are quite a few of them since our friend Tom asked me to look at global models. I looked at various models here. So this one you can see typically there is like um, almost 50% engineering. We should not forget we are engineers, not scientists. You know, some people think they are interested in science then they come to biomedical engineering, but engineers are different. We are problem solvers, we design, we make equipment, we generate revenue for the country. We are not just after new knowledge in which case you can go to uh, graduate studies. Okay? So math, sciences, and humanities, uh, if you start looking at this, what this shows is in the first year you have to have the basic math and sciences, the second year you introduce engineering, third year you start with the basics of biomedical engineering, and the fourth year you have electives as well as the capstone design. Okay? So I used uh, you know, Asia Pacific, Hong Kong, you know, Chinese University of Hong Kong, uh, also in Taiwan. Uh, you can see that some schools have more engineering. In fact, you'll find that uh, in Australia, they have less of a requirement of humanities and social science, and that allows them to have more courses in engineering, which is you know, something liked, but the faculty senate has to approve. Okay. This is from Singapore and India, and at least 50% in engineering. There's Drexel and MSOE, or Milwaukee School of Engineering, well-known, Louisiana Tech, Rose Hulman, very popular in the Model 2 area. Okay. Northwestern, University of Washington. You see that these, they have more sciences because many of them go to graduate programs. Okay. So the top 10, you can go to look at US News and World Report. You know, uh, their models are very different. As I mentioned, if you ask a survey, more than 80% of the graduates will go to graduate school, or they go to medical school, or law school. Some of them may even go to vet school, or dental school. So they're all possible from bachelor's degree in biomedical engineering. Okay. This one, just to show you the number of credits, so somewhere between 130 to 135 is a typical number of credits which allows more lab-based courses. It is absolutely essential to have lab components in biomedical engineering training. Just having theory may be boring to students, and they don't really understand and relate it. And as I mentioned, you try to introduce failure modes, and in the labs you can do that. And with uh, things such as uh, software available, with SolidWorks, with MATLAB, toolboxes, uh, it is ComSol, you can do quite a bit with them. Okay. So these are a lot of uh, analysis done, but I guess basically you see that if we compare the model one, two, three, they're all in the same ballpark. You can see this, this is for Asian Pacific University. There's a little bit of a spread with respect to combination of engineering and biomedical engineering courses. So if you compare, there are quarter system, the advantage of quarter system is they could have more subjects covered or more course, courses covered. So not including summer, they can have three quarters. So this is very helpful when you want to introduce things such as uh, quality assurance, you want to introduce ethics, it is possible to introduce those. And you also want to introduce components such as 3D printing, manufacturing, you know, these are areas that our students get interested in. So average credit distribution you can see is you need to have a bulk of the engineering and biomedical engineering, about at least 50%. Okay? So when we compare, we find that biomedical engineering courses about 50% and about 60% including biomedical engineering and engineering. You cannot sacrifice on that. Uh, many universities, you know, increasingly, depending on the role the faculty senate plays, you know, they are trying to introduce more and more humanities. Of course, it is essential. 
And I think you will hear in many of the presentations that communication is very important for biomedical engineers. Particularly, when we work as clinical engineers in hospital, they have to work with a wide variety of people with different expectations. And normally, they have problems when they are communicating. So we should know how to correctly communicate with them, how to communicate with the leaders, the vendors, patients, doctors, laboratory persons. So communication is very, very essential. And it is good to have separate required courses. And uh, we have in the past recommended that biomedical engineers teach the communication courses because they understand them better than people who studied Shakespeare. You know. So average credit distribution here, you find that biomedical engineering and engineering about 60% is a good model. Math and sciences about 30% or about a third. And the humanities about like 13, 15%. So that is a distribution. As far as co-ops or internships concerned, you can have a model which uh, either in the summer or in my model, it is that it's you have in the junior year, you go during spring, the senior year during fall, and in the sophomore year, you can have an optional co-op in the summer. So by the time the students graduate, they have one year of training. Uh, when they go for co-op, it is not good practice to just send them to a hospital and expect they learn. We as educators need to work with the hospitals carefully so there is a well-defined program for them. When I went to Mass General, I developed a program. Before that, it was not there. They just came and just did some testing. Uh, they bought infusion pumps, so a student, uh, you know, an intern did about 1,000 infusion pumps in four months. This is not a good co-op experience. So they need to devise a program very well so they have a clear exposure to various departments and they also are given something important but obviously under the supervision so that the responsibility is properly taken into account. And in the hospitals they can also you know, uh, re interact with doctors, they get idea of new products and understand what the strategic plans are and it's always good to see the suffering of patients so we are only in the university setting they don't really understand and see how we, as engineers, we can contribute to improving the quality of life of patients. Okay. okay. So here, I think uh, I, Yadin should be happy <laughs> looking at this one. <laughs> so I, I actually started my talk uh, when I was preparing. This was the first slide, actually. <laughs> you know, and then uh, I guess our friend uh, uh, Ernesto is also somewhere in the crowd. <laughs> So you have a book here, actually this, uh, this book by Ernesto and uh, this the Dairo and this is uh, Adin and this book, can you guess, this is by Caesar Caceres, how many of you can guess when it was published? 1977. Oh, I didn't want you to guess, <laughs> you gave the answer. <laughs> this was 1977, okay. I looked at some of the blocks, diagrams, actually you see these are still good today. I took some time to look through. I mean, it may not be covering a lot, but it covers all the elements. 77, 42 years ago. And then they also defined, I mean, here we are trying to talk about identity and identification and recognition. And, you know, this was done 42 years ago. You know, and a lot of it, of course, they focused a lot on electrical safety and instrumentation. They didn't have all the complex things I showed in the earlier part of my slides. But a lot of this definition, if you have interest, you know, 1977, you can get a book and look at it. I wanted to touch on the learning models because when you are working in a university, you also want to get promoted and you want to be liked by students. Students use different techniques. It is not conventional lecture problem solving exams. You have problem-based learning, project-based learning, evidence-based learning, blended learning, cl flipped classrooms, competency-based learning. MOOCs, I don't know how well they will come. Khan Academy is not good for biomedical engineering, but good for math and physics, I think. So embedded pedagogies are going to be very helpful. Uh, online learning, you know, so learning management systems, I think normally universities do spend some time. We should use it very efficiently. Accreditation should satisfy the following students, program educational objectives, student outcomes, continuous improvement, curriculum, faculty, facilities, and institutional support. Okay. I normally show this to students who are likely to join biomedical engineering. 
so they can get jobs using the models. There are a lot of jobs available. They can go to graduate studies. You know, they can go to medical school, dental school, vet school. They can go to law school. They can go to business administration. They can be entrepreneurial. Okay. The graduates, future graduates, what about the rewards? They will be efficient and productive in industry. This leads to economic growth. Healthcare delivery will become more effective, and we as educators can take some credit you know, in this, which can lead to cost containment, new inventions, and innovative solutions to emerging healthcare problem. And this has a major societal impact. And I know our friend Adriana you know, talks about problem solving and with societies having low resources, I think biomedical engineers can really play a good role and we educate our students and have projects for them which can become solutions to many of these projects. Okay. So rewards, accreditation is needed. So you earn a degree from accredited uh, program that verifies the quality is good and then it's easier to get jobs. Okay. Career-ready education, build effective relations between employers and colleges. That's very essential. Get the employers to come and give lectures to your students. I think in ABED program, it is required to have industry professional advisory council. We have to adapt to emerging trends. We cannot use the same lecture notes we used three years before. So ours keep changing all the time. We have to identify what the barriers are and evaluate new opportunities. Just want to touch on a couple of things, miniaturization and 3D printing. They are becoming very popular now. Uh, in terms of market predictions, AI, we talked a lot about AI, data-driven business models, AR, augmented reality, and virtual reality. Okay? Smartphone, mobile health technologies. You know, so work closely with the computer science people, have a joint program or joint course. Orthopedics. Robotic automation for hospital processes, smart home-based aging. So this I will skip. I think I will show this slide to Fred se separately. The recommendations on improving, we should be uh, seeking accreditation. One program will not fit for all. You need to design the program to suit your needs. It has to be adaptive to the site, the region, and country's specific needs. Internship or co-op is good. Uh, we must work towards establishing a very strong identity for biomedical engineers. And we should encourage student participation. Whenever I see students in, in research or in the conferences, I'm always happy. For masters, this is probably at another time, you know, there can be somebody going from a regular accredited biomedical engineering program. They can also go to masters from uh, electrical engineering, mechanical, or computer engineering. and. Uh, there is a trend for some persons from a completely different program. In some countries, uh, medicine is an undergraduate degree, so they can go from there, they can go with biology background, and in the last case, is, you know, depending on the type of uh, college, you can have a customized program of study. So in conclusion, there are different methods for designing and implementing the programs. Uh, I presented a few models. You can have variations of these models, but it's essential that we try to promote biomedical engineering and clinical engineering programs, this will certainly contribute towards improving the quality of care and the health. So we, all the biomedical engineers, work towards better life globally. Thank you very much.